Good afternoon. Please let me welcome, in the name of the European Society of Endocrinology, and its president, Andrea Justina, who is today not with us. My name is Martin Reinke, and I'm currently president-elect of the European Society of Endocrinology. And I will take office as your president in 2021. My hometown is Munich in Bavaria, Germany, and I'm a clinical endocrinologist. This afternoon, I will be chairing today's European Society of Endocrinology talk on endocrine conditions in the COVID-19 area. We are all tremendously affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, which has the deepest impact on our health, well-being, economy, and self-determination. SARS-CoV-2 has brought terrible suffering to our patients, our colleagues, our families, and our societies. It is a tragedy of unforeseen dim dimension, and I'm unfortunately sure that it will be remembered by the coming generations. These European Society of Endocrinology talks are one of the many responses to the pandemic from the endocrine side. It covers the latest endocrine science in a series of live webinars by the world leading experts. The first five easy talks include content from the European Journal of Endocrinology free review series, which you may check. Um, coupled with the easy statement on COVID-19 and endocrine diseases. Today topic, today's topic is Cushing syndrome. Cushing syndrome has always been one of the most challenging diseases in diagnosis and therapy. The COVID-19 pandemic adds an additional layer of complexity to it. Patients may be especially at risk because of immunosuppression and because of the treatment, because the treatment toolbox is limited because, for example, of shutdown. Therefore, I am glad and very proud to welcome some of the world leading experts for Cushing syndrome. Our speaker of today is John Newell Price from the United Kingdom. John is Professor of Endocrinology at the University of Sheffield and Sheffield Teaching Hospital NHS, NHS Foundation Trust. Hello, John. And we have three renowned panel discussants. Dr. Lynette Niemann is a senior investigator at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, US, and head of the endocrine consult service at the NIH Clinical Center. Antoine Tabarin is Professor of Endocrinology and Head of the Department of Endocrinology, Diabetes and Nutrition at the University Hospital of Bordeaux. And Jérôme Berthera is Professor of Endocrinology at Paris Descartes University, Chief of the Endocrine, Endocrinology Department of Cochin Hospital. Great to have you here today. And we have administrative support by Claire Arago, Arigoni and Vicky Di Giusto from the easy stuff in the background. The first part of today's webinar will be John's presentation. Thereafter, we will have a live question and answer session between the panelists, followed by questions by you, the audience. Hopefully, we will have many questions. Please type your questions via the Q&A button below throughout the presentation. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. John, the floor is yours. Uh, Martin, thank you very much. So I'm now just going to um, share my screen and move to the presentation. So um, I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you very much for joining. We were shared with us uh, via Claire the numbers of different people from all over the world. In fact, there's a vast number of people. So although Martin said good afternoon, it is good morning and good evening for some of you. So um, 
I need to just make my disclosures here uh, because of course some of the things that I'm going to discuss are compounds which are made by some of these companies. So this really is based, uh, or I'm giving a talk, um, but really as you'll see from the authors on this talk, so this was the guidance that was published uh, just a month or so ago uh, in the European Journal of Endocrinology. And you'll see that I am presenting, but I'm really presenting it on behalf of the co-authors, all of whom are on this webinar with Martin as our chair. But I want to also emphasize uh, the gratitude to the reviewers because we had Jerome who was on this call, Andre Lacroix, Alberto Pereira, and Peter Trainer, who gave up their weekends to rapidly review this so that the article could be published in a very time efficient fashion. And actually, ultimately, we need to give great thanks to Viv Kialt, who was the senior editor of the European Journal, whose idea it was, was to try and gather these uh, urgent uh, advice guidance together. And down at the bottom here, you'll see the uh, access uh, URL to be able to get the article, which is, of course, open access from uh, the European Journal of Endocrinology. So in my talk, I'm going to go through some of the challenges. Uh, Martin has already um, illustrated what some of those challenges may be. What are the key issues for the diagnosis? So how do we need to think about Cushing's in, in general terms, but then how do we need to think about it in the context uh, of when there is an epidemic such as COVID-19 uh, in play? And then I think importantly, how do the normal strategies we use for diagnosis, how do they differ from the ways that we as a group who uh, derive these guidelines and the reviewers together came to a consensus on what we felt was reasonable ways of considering diagnostic strategies and treatment strategies. And then really, how do those differ from what we would normally do? And then I'm gonna um, spend some time discussing about medical treatment. And at the end, I've got a couple of cases which I hope will illustrate some of these principles. But when making uh, this presentation, it's on the basis that there is still a high SARS-CoV-2 viral prevalence. So for example, in Europe at the moment, uh, fortunately, it looks as if life is starting to return to more normal than it was, but certainly by no means normal. But there may of course be a second wave, there may be another episode where uh, it becomes a much higher viral prevalence. But around the world, each individual country as a difference. So the risk benefit ratio of what we are suggesting in these recommendations need to be reevaluated in each country and, and really within countries at different locales. And how that will vary will depend on the healthcare structures and of course the phase of the pandemic in each of those uh, different geographical situations. So what are the challenges? Well, as alluded to by Martin, Cushing's is pretty difficult at the best of times. And if you are then trying to uh, investigate, diagnose and manage Cushing's where you may not have all of your normal available diagnostic um, tools available, and indeed you've got patients who are worried, patients who may be self-isolating, etc., that makes life much harder. And it's really important that patient with active disease is immunosuppressed. They are at much greater risk than someone of the normal population and therefore they do not want to be coming into contact with people with COVID-19 uh, um, COVID themselves and therefore it's important that they are advised to socially isolate and that can make difficulty for both diagnosis but also for treatment and also for monitoring. We recognize diabetes is a major risk for adverse outcomes in COVID-19. So that needs very active attention in the patient with Cushing's. And I think one of the main drives of our recommendations is to really place as high a weight on the clinical assessment as any other part. Of course, we should all do that anyway in our general practice before um, the, the outbreak of um, COVID-19, but more so now where that clinical assessment will really make a decision point as to what particular investigation should then follow. And I hope to be able to illustrate that in some of the coming slides. And the reason for that is because our biochemical tests aren't always available and the diagnostic approach that we use may be different because imaging investigations too may be less available. Some hospitals don't have the facility to be able to 
uh, scam people as quickly or as easily if they are overwhelmed with uh, COVID-19 patients, or indeed there's an issue whether you've got uh, clean COVID-19 areas and places with COVID-19 within the hospital for scanning. So all that makes a difference as to how we would normally practice. And then importantly, we recognize the commonest cause of Cushing's is Cushing's disease. But transphenoidal surgery appears to be one of the best ways to transmit this virus. And there was an episode in Wuhan where a whole uh, theater staff went down with COVID-19 from a single patient during uh, such a procedure. So therefore, pituitary surgery may be not uh, as widely practiced, at least when there is very high SARS-CoV-2 prevalence. But again, that will vary in different, different healthcare structures. So these are some of the background to some of the challenges. So just to emphasize this aspect of reliance on clinical assessment, this is where there is the need to consider either phone or video consultations, careful discussion of the risks and the benefits of investigation, and importantly, those patients who are judged to have either moderate or severe disease, these are urgent cases, they are immunosuppressed, they need their cortisol to be rapidly addressed and lowered to improve their overall state and also for their comorbidities to be treated. So by way of revision, I'm now gonna turn just to a few slides on clinical signs in Cushing's, because we recognize that they have many, patients have many, many different physical signs, which I have listed here, ranging between things like acne and increased facial hair, which are common, but not very discriminating, to other physical signs. And really, we would recommend to ensure that focus is made on those signs which are associated with protein wasting, and these are the more discriminatory signs of Cushing. So they include striae, they include thin skin and bruising, proximal myopathy, and of course, facial plethora. So these are really important physical signs which may help one discriminate between someone who has true moderate to severe Cushing's as opposed to someone in whom it's less clear as to what actual diagnosis they have, be it mild Cushing's or perhaps some aspect of obesity or polycystic ovarian syndrome or any other uh, syndrome associated uh, with some subtle signs that could be Cushing's but ultimately turn out not to be Cushing's. Another thing to emphasize is that uh, there are discriminating complications which may uh, point one in the direction of Cushing's, particularly if they occur at a young age. So the young man in his 20s who for some reason presents with an osteoporotic uh, crush fracture also is noted to be hypertensive, one would have a very low threshold for thinking that they may have Cushing's. And in children in particular, weight gain with a reduced height percentile is a very good sign that they may have Cushing's because uh, hypercortisolemia is an extremely good way to stop children from growing. Instagram's your friend. So uh, if indeed people will put pictures of themselves up on Instagram if they're developing Cushing's, but nevertheless, phones, people are always having pictures of themselves on the phone. And that is a very useful diagnostic tool, very useful for Cushing's, very useful for other endocrine conditions such as acromegaly. But for Cushing's particularly, because the rate of change is usually uh, quicker, people often have a catalog of photographs which will help you make uh, a diagnosis. And certainly when patients have been cured or in remission, they often send you pictures to demonstrate how fantastic they feel compared to before their diagnosis was made. Finally, it's imperative that in any patients in whom the diagnosis of Cushing's consider that there is a thorough drug history to make sure that there isn't any excess glucocorticoid that could account for and confuse the diagnostic um, picture. One slide on hypercortisolism by itself, because hypercortisolism does not equal Cushing. So here is a box showing that these are individuals in whom there may be some symptoms that would fit with Cushing's in where there is hypercortisolism, but clearly they do not have Cushing's. And in contrast, there are patients where there is a biochemical feature of hypercortisolism where it's very unusual to have features of Cushing syndrome. So we emphasize this uh, back in the Endocrine Society guidelines because there are important catches uh, and it's important to consider these 
in the context of could this patient have Cushing's and to be sure that one doesn't get misled simply because someone's had a cortisol measurement done at a time when it's likely to be high but for other reasons. So then turning to a diagnostic strategy, really if there is a clinical assessment made uh, by uh, the um, individual, by the uh, endocrinologist, the question then is um, by phone call, by video, the question then is, is, well, what is it like? Is it possible to make an, an assessment? And that's where, if it's not possible by phone, it may be necessary by video. It may even be necessary in a face-to-face -face consultation, again, depending the state of the um, COVID-19 situation. Oops, it seems to have frozen. But if it's deemed that there is a moderate or severe, really this is urgent investigation is needed. And under that circumstance, um, we would recommend the use of either the milligram overnight dexamethasone suppression test or the 24-hour urinary free cortisol. And the higher the level of serum cortisol after the dexamethasone suppression test or the higher the value of urinary free cortisol, the greater confidence we'd have that they have Cushing's. But if someone's got features which are moderate or severe and their serum cortisol is extremely elevated, but they're not acutely unwell at that time, then really that makes it very, very likely indeed that they have Cushing's. And it is sufficient, almost certain, to actually um, make the diagnosis. But we re recommend measuring electrolytes, glucose, a basal plasma ACTH, an HbA1c and a full blood count, and a CRP at the same time, because the CRP may help distinguish between patients who are unwell or actually uh, truly well. But if the assessment is that the patient has mild or questionable disease, then the suggestion is to not do tests, to make a clinical real evaluation three to six months later, and then only to investigate depending on the pandemic state. Now that is awkward for endocrinologists. Endocrinologists like to move to make a proper diagnosis. But the problem in these people is that the actual making the diagnosis is harder. And then the question is about the intervention and the benefit that those patients may actually get at that time. And if it is the case that patients are triaged to a case where they're going to be followed up, then it's very important though, if they have hypertension, diabetes, other comorbidities, that these are optimized. And then later on, they can be reconsidered. And if it's still question or mild, they can continue round on this track, depending on the COV-19 situation. Alternatively, if they have progressed, and of course, progression of clinical features makes it more likely that they got Cushing's, then they would fall back into the moderate and severe box and then go down this test. Now, at this point where clinicians uh, are clear in their minds that the patient has Cushing's, I think we would make a deviation from our usual careful differential diagnostic strategy. And that is because of the limitations that we have in terms of scanning and other investigations, for example, bilateral inferior petrosocyanus sampling, etc. So once Cushing is confirmed, the suggestion is to do two things at the same time. To do a CT scan of the chest, abdomen and pelvis, and also to discuss early with someone who is an expert if you're not an expert yourself. And the thinking behind this is that if a CT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis is done, this will immediately identify if there's an adrenal cortical carcinoma or an overt ectopic ACTH source that could require some immediate management. At the same time, the CT scan will identify vertebral fractures, it will identify infectious foci, and it will identify um, other problems which may be apparent, which will, may assist in the overall management of the patient. If the patient has an active field defect, then it would be reasonable to consider an MRI scan, but again, at the time of uh, SARS-CoV-2 high viral prevalence, there may be issues with getting an MRI scan. But it's also important to note that a pituitary macroadenoma is often not a usual cause of either moderate or severe Cushing's. Nevertheless, it's a sensible and reasonable thing to do. And the other thing, an important thing, is that the um, situation is, is that the CT appearances of a patient with uh, 
COVID-19, can also overlap with other features which are due to opportunistic infections such as neonocystis. So that is important because of course that would require different treatment. If then the patient is identified as having one of these two rare causes, then there can be a discussion about the risks and benefits of surgery. Surgery itself is carrying an immunosuppressive uh, problem. Surgery itself is very poorly tolerated. A recent paper came out uh, in the last week demonstrating that if patients contract COVID-19 in the postoperative period, they are at very severe risk of complications. Nevertheless, this is an individualized discussion that would have to take place with each patient. If it's then elected that surgery wouldn't be right, then medical treatment is advised. I'm going to come on to that in a slide or so. Um, if though the initial CT scan does not show one of these features, then it's suggested that the patient has medical treatment. You'll notice here that I haven't talked at all about pituitary surgery or anything to do with that. And the reason along those lines is because of the difficulty with doing pituitary surgery uh, at certainly when the SARS-CoV-2 prevalence is high. Nevertheless, that further investigation of pituitary surgery or other surgery in selected cases can certainly be considered if there's site-threatening problems due to a macroadenoma or as and when the pandemic and the status uh, of the healthcare systems allow further investigation. And really in those patients, it would be important to stop medical treatment and to reinvestigate, effectively start from scratch, go back to the beginning and then do the normal diagnostic algorithms. It's important to emphasize that any surgery that takes place needs to be done by a highly experienced surgical team with all the appropriate PPE for uh, avoidance of uh, SARS-CoV-2 transmission. So that, as you can see, is different to the way we would normally practice, and that will vary depending on the pandemic in your particular locality. Talking about medical therapy, there are some key principles. It's vital to treat the comorbidities, uh, such as diabetes and hypertension, hyperkalemia, et cetera. For the majority of patients, we would recommend using steroidogenesis inhibitors because they treat all patients. In severe cases, it's reasonable to use pneumocystics prophylaxis with trimethoprim and sulfoxazole. And those patients who are awaiting to finish a treatment, one would advise using low molecular weight heparin to avoid the complications of venous thromboembolism. In terms of the medical treatment, one way to get around some of the problems of medical treatment is to use a block and replace regime. And the reason for that is it limits the need for monitoring and it limits the risk of adrenal insufficiency once it's been established. And I will illustrate that in a moment in one of the slides. And those patients who are already on treatment can, of course, be switched to a block, block and replace regime. So if they're already on a, for example, dose titration regime, they can be switched to a block, block and replace regime with the aim of using monitoring on a less frequent basis. Of course, some of these patients will be isolating and therefore getting access to the, uh, the hospitals to have the test done will not be as straightforward. Importantly, patients must be given extra oral glucocorticoid tablets so they can take if they need to in terms of adrenal insufficiency. And we would recommend the access to an intramuscular hydrocortisone pack and certainly a dedicated phone number the patients can contact on to get access to the endocrine department, nurses uh, and endocrinologists. And patients in the same way that we would do for any patient with adrenal insufficiency should have education about sick day rules uh, written down and also uh, spoken to about when and how to take extra glucocorticoid when unwell, if on a blocking regime of the steroidogenesis inhibitor. I've said it once, but I'd say it again. If you're not familiar with using these drugs, discuss with people who are. In terms of monitoring, um, urinary free cortisols can be collected remotely. The patient can measure the volume and then an aliquot can be sent to, sent to the lab. So that makes uh, monitoring quite straightforward. Of course, you must avoid urinary free cortisone if the patient is taking hydrocortisone or if they're on a glucocorticoid, glucocorticoid receptor antagonist. Serum cortisol values can be used uh, either at baseline in the morning or serum cortisol uh, day curves measured across the day and they can be useful but of course that requires the patient to actually have the blood test taken. 
Importantly, if metarapone is being used, there is a very sharp increase in most patients, particularly when there is an ACTH drive from a pituitary source of 11-deoxycortisol and its metabolites, and that will cross-react with many immunoassays for cortisol. So if possible, it's recommended to either know that there's no cross-reactivity or to use uh, tandem mass spectrometry. And then once the regime is established, then the monitoring can be extended uh, between, or the interval between monitoring and extended. What to choose? Well, that will determine, that'll be determined to a great part of what's available in your countries. Um, where it's available, the suggestion is to use metarapone. Uh, the reason for that is that it has fewer drug-drug interactions than ketoconazole. Uh, it works extremely well, um, but nevertheless, it may not be available. It's important to note that if there is hypokalemia, that can be exacerbated uh, by the buildup of the cortisol precursor molecules uh, that have mineralocorticoid activity. If one is using ketoconazole, it's important that the liver biochemistry tests are checked for the first three months uh, every month. Uh, the EMA guidance says more regularly than that, but again, depending on the state of the pandemic in your locality, it may be reasonable not to do it quite as frequently. Importantly, ketoconazole needs stomach acid to be absorbed, so if a patient is on a proton pump inhibitor, that will prevent it from having its full and usual effect. And ketoconazole has far more drug-drug interactions based on CYP3A4 uh, metabolism, and that needs careful consideration depending on what other drugs a patient is taking. So here is a suggested uh, block and replace regime. Uh, using either metarapone or ketoconazole, initiating at 500 milligrams three times a day for metarapone in the first few days, or ketoconazole 200 milligrams uh, three times a day. And that then to escalate the dose uh, quickly, you'll see up to 1,000 milligrams three times a day or 400 milligrams three times a day for ketoconazole. And at the same time as doing this, to add in glucocorticoid replacement, either with hydrocortisone, with dexamethasone, or prednisolone, at these sort of doses, as if for adrenal insufficiency. That's the replacement part. And then, when that is achieved, to still ensure that the dose is escalated sufficiently with the steroidogenesis inhibitor, aiming to try and make sure the endogenous cortisol production is really inhibited. And then in terms of monitoring, the 9 EM serum cortisol pre-dose of metarapone or ketoconazole and glucocorticoid, just simply aiming for the lowest number. So if you've got a very low level of cortisol, you can be fairly sure that you managed to block sufficiently. The danger of this regime is that there is insufficient block and therefore you've got the insufficient block and the addition of glucocorticoid, which doesn't treat the Cushing's as well as it should be. With these types of doses, very often it's possible to get an extremely good control of the level of cortisol. If using 24-hour urinary free cortisol, the glucocorticoid, if it's hydrocortisone being replaced, could be switched to either dexamethasone or prednisolone, and you're just aiming for the lowest levels. And then really once adequate block is confirmed, then the monitoring can be more intermittent and the patient continue both on a tarapone or ketoconazole together with the glucocorticoid. I've now just got two cases which I hope illustrate some of these principles. So this was a 65-year-old man, and you'll see he was admitted, at least in the UK, this was right in the height uh, of the pandemic, uh, right uh, a week or two after lockdown uh, presented. So he presented through our emergency department with a two-month week history of weakness, and he was unable to mobilize. And interestingly, when you looked at the care records, in fact, he'd been noted to be hypokalemic in February of this year. And interestingly, he'd been diagnosed having diabetes mellitus in primary care. You'll see that in January this year, his HbA1c was normal, but then by February, it was more elevated. And actually shortly after that, just a few weeks later, it was getting worse. And when he came in, his initial SARS-CoV-2 PCR was negative. Now, it was fortunate for this man that it happened to be my colleague, Miguel de Bono, on as the acute admitting uh, consultant. Uh, Miguel uh, is uh, one of my endocrine colleagues here. And on further history, interesting, the patient had had weight loss, not weight gain over two months, but was extremely plethoric. His skin was very thin, bruising with severe myopathy.
uh, and the patient was, however, not acutely unwell. And Miguel made quite correctly the diagnosis of severe Cushing's syndrome on the basis of his uh, history and on these physical features. He had some degree of hypoxia, but it wasn't too severe. Potassium was right down just below the normal range and his serum glucose was elevated. The same day, uh, it was arranged for his serum cortisol to be measured. It was extremely elevated, over 3,000 millimoles per litre or 103 micrograms per deciliter. His neutrophil count, and interestingly going back in primary care, his neutrophil count had been elevated since February, but not before. And that, in the context of his clinical picture, I think dates the onset of his Cushing's with the diabetes, the hyperkalemia, and the neutrophils to around about February this year, so a very rapid onset. And unsurprisingly, a CT scan, which was arranged of his chest, abdomen, and pelvis, demonstrated some irregular lung masses, high lymph nodes, pleural nodes. There wasn't consolidation. There was some atelectasis, and there was a large left adrenal mass and some other nodes. And the working diagnosis is the patient had a small cell lung cancer due to ectopic ACTH, or possibly an adrenal cortical carcinoma with lung metastases, although less likely. So the same day he was initiated on metarapone. You'll see here that he was initiated on a higher dose than the one I just uh, had in my previous schema. This man had absolutely terrible Cushing's. So it was one gram four times a day. And in fact, that was increased to 1.25 grams four times a day just after the second day. He was then initiated uh, on hydrocortisone, 10 milligrams three times a day after the third day. Potassium supplements were made and he had monitoring of capillary glycoid glucose, antihypertensives were added, and he was given low molecular weight heparin. Four days later, we had his plasma, or sorry, a few days later, we had his plasma ACTH results. So this confirmed the diagnosis as being ACTH dependent due to a small cell lung cancer rather than an ACC. And his serum cortisol by that stage had fallen down to 246 nanomoles per liter. So this is after four to five days of metarapone. And at that point, his glycolyzide had to be stopped, which the GPs had initiated, uh, because in fact, his glucose had fallen quite quickly. He developed a sinus tachycardia and was considered perhaps to have had a P for a pulmonary embolus. That was not the case, but his procalcitonin was elevated and therefore it was consistent with a bacterial infection for which he received antibiotics. And unsurprisingly, his histology came back as small cell carcinoma with an extremely high ki 67 index. His serum potassium normalized by uh, 10 days or so after the terapone, and then he was maintained on the block and replace regime and transferred to the oncologist with continuing endocrine input, illustrating how quickly the patient needs to be treated to get on top of all these other problems. Second case was uh, a young man referred uh, again during uh, our lockdown period uh, in March, and there was a question of Cushing's. He'd had a history of obesity, weight gain, and abdominal striae, weighed 120 kilograms. He'd had two urinary free cortisol levels which had been elevated, two others which had been uh, normal. These had been done prior to lockdown. His HbA1c was normal. Uh, and so I performed a telephone clinic to try and make an assessment. He certainly wasn't physically unwell, told me he'd always been heavy since he was a young child, but his weight had increased particularly over the last five years. Uh, but interestingly, he had continued to grow till about two years ago and had reached an adult height of 1.8 meters. And he was saying that he had all these stretch marks on his abdomen and his mood was variable. And also the fact that he had a buffalo hump and that was, he had read about Cushing's and was pretty sure that that was the cause of his problems. And he wasn't prescribed any other medication. So it's difficult to make a full assessment. So a video assessment was made. The patient was really convinced he had Cushing's and been present for some years, but he had no overt signs. His skin looked normal, there's certainly no bruising. His mother had uh, hypertension and had a BP monitor, and that was normal on a home monitor. He had a round face, but it wasn't overtly plethoric. He certainly did have a buffalo hump, but he had truncal and generalized obesity. But the striae were faded, they were non violaceous. Uh, and really, I was able to get him to squat down. He was able to stand up unaided. So my impression was he didn't have any clear features of Cushing's, but of course, you've got those two uh, chemical measures, which was just he might have Cushing's. It was a pretty lengthy conversation. Went on for an hour. And the fact that he had grown to a normal height was against the fact that he had the diagnosis for years, because of course, as a child, it would have almost certainly stopped his growth. Uh, 
and we discussed the issues with false positive or biochemical tests. And he agreed to having a further clinical assessment in three months with no further biochemical tests. So Martin, in conclusion, it's challenging. It's very challenging. It's important to make careful clinical assessment. If there's doubt, we assess after some months. You may well have to alter the diagnostic pathways, urgent medical treatment for severe cases, uh, and definitive surgery may have to be deferred. So I haven't really gone into Cushing's disease itself, but even in the patients who may have Cushing's disease, they may need medical treatment prior to uh, transfer or surgery. And if in doubt, phone a friendly expert. So with that, uh, I'll pass back to you, uh, Martin, uh, for the panel uh, and the questions. Thank you, John, for a fantastic talk. Very comprehensive, very to the point. Great. And now we start with a panel uh, discussion. Um, so you have time to put in questions. We have already two, so please, uh, audience, don't hesitate to put your questions. We look forward to them. So my first question is to you, John. Um, you did not mention saliv uh, saliva cortisol as a diagnostic test. And in the European Journal article, we suggested to abstain, to use it. Can you comment on it? And what is your current position? Okay, so we thought about that quite um, hard. Our concern had been that that might be quite a good vector by which to spread uh, SARS-CoV-2 and, and therefore put people at risk uh, because of spitting into a tube might actually carry the virus with it. Now, um, it, it generated quite a lot of discussion uh, by some colleagues around the world um, saying that they're perfectly used to using protective measures, etc. Nevertheless, we felt at the time that it was sensible to avoid the use of salivary cortisol. I think perhaps now people are looking back and they've put measures in place which would make it uh, safe to handle the samples. But I understand that the Koch Institute in Germany still considers this a potentially highly infectious uh, media, the saliva that is. So I think it's, it's beholden upon any country or any lab handling the saliva samples to make sure they're being handled safely. Having said that, having said all that, if it's only a salivary cortisol that's elevated and there's full suppression on dexamethasone and the urinary free cortisol is normal, it isn't very likely the patient has severe Cushing's. And therefore, this is more likely to fall into the mild category. And as a consequence, may one consider just reassessing in a few months. Thank you. Um, I have a question for you, Lynette. Um, the US have been hit also very hard by the pandemic. And as far as I know, the uh, NIH was very much closed down. So uh, can you summarize your experience with uh, Cushing's diagnosis and treatment during that time? And Yes, uh, thank you. And, and I really think that John covered uh, almost all of the points that I would make. We have been uh, taking many email referrals or uh, email questions from our colleagues around the world, and primarily though in the United States. And as you all may or may not know, the situation is very different in different parts of the country. So as John mentioned, it's very important to assess what's available in each location. Uh, what we've been doing is assessing via email, uh, occasionally via a FaceTime or a Zoom kind of a meeting and by phone. Uh, that's worked out extremely well. Uh, we, we're very lucky to have colleagues who oftentimes have already initiated some uh, evaluation so that it's been we've been able to sort of divide people into these two groups of urgently needing some care uh, we have someone who's going to come in in about two weeks who is um, quite ill um, and then patients who are not ill are not uh, extremely ill and so we're deferring their evaluation just as john said so i think one has to be very aware of what's available in your area uh, think about ways to get at this diagnosis without our usual testing. And again, I, I would very strongly uh, endorse the concept that our clinical judgment is extremely important at this particular time. And if um, one is not really sure of what's going on, just call up somebody who sees a lot of these patients because we're all very happy to help um, our colleagues. Thank you. Um, because 
John has put so much emphasis on clinical evaluation and the most discriminatory signs and symptoms. What would you like to add from your perspective, US, um, um, also a society with quite some uh, obesity prevalence, which makes the diagnosis more difficult. So what do you tell as an expert to those who are not so expert? Where they sh should they look? I think uh, if your focus is on uh, finding the patient who requires urgent care, urgent evaluation, then I agree that all, many of these patients will have uh, diabetes, a new, new onset of new things. So diabetes, hypertension, hypokalemia, these are all very helpful. The more chronic conditions of weight gain, chronic hypertension for many years, not very helpful. You're really looking for a relatively acute or recent change in um, the person's health. Um, the patient I'm going to be admitting um, had a cardiac arrest and probably a pulmonary embolism. That's pretty uh, dramatic. She previously had been quite well. So taking a very good history, I think is extremely important. This is one of the times where you can't just ask three questions and be done. You have to really understand what's been going on and what has changed. Yeah, thank you. And then um, one question is if you have a patient with very mild symptoms or you are thinking it's not really Cushing, typical of Cushing, however, still there's some, um, uh, um, it could be still a patient who has beginning of Cushing. So how long is it possible to wait until, and if you don't miss, or if you miss the diagnosis at the beginning, when it becomes dangerous for the patient? Yeah, so it's, it's pretty clear, I think, that the uh, major morbidity and mortality in Cushing's occurs as it gets more severe. So that what you really want to do is put in place some sort of a monitoring a clinical monitoring system where you can see if things are changing. So we spend a lot of time educating patients about all the different features of Cushing's and what they should look out for. Uh, I, it's really wonderful when someone has access to a blood pressure monitor at home. Um, so we really ask them, call us if something changes, whatever it might be, and then we'll talk about it and see whether there's an issue. It, so it's both the, what is the benefit of intervening but the benefit really depends on the risk. And so the risk is greatest when people have more severe Cushing's. Not to say that people are not at some risk, but I think in people like case number two, where it's, there's really almost nothing except some mild elevation in urine cortisol, which many of us probably have during these times anyway, because we're stressed and anxious. So when that's our only um, marker, I would say most patients, feel comfortable when you explain to them that their risk is when they get worse and that gives them incentive to let you know when they think something has changed. Um, there's no question that, I mean, there's been a recent paper showing that there's a long delay to diagnosis, but I think once you've identified somebody who's mild, you shorten the time to a true diagnosis by following them over time. Thank you. Antoine, a question to you. Um, the European Journal article stresses that subtyping differential diagnosis of ACTH depending Cushing should be limited. So how do you deal or how were how you dealing with CRIH test MRI during the pandemic in an ACTH dependent Cushing patient? You have to turn on your mic, please. Okay, so uh as John mentioned, uh, the diagnostic attitude must be very different from uh, during the context of the epidemic uh, if we want to minimize uh, hospital visits. So uh, it should be remembered first that the, the most common case of a CTH dependent Cushing syndrome is Cushing's disease. And that there are a number of uh, simple indicators that have a great diagnostic value. Uh, indeed, in, in a female individual, with a slow progression of symptom, I would say a, a moderate elevation of urinary free cortisol, let's say less than five folds, the upper limit of normal, and with a moderate increase in uh, plasma CTH, let's say less than 100 picogram per milliliter, the probability of Cushing's disease is probably more than 95%. So uh, 
according to jo what John mentioned, if you also have a negative uh, CT scan of the chest abdomen, uh, the probability is even more. And I, and I don't know really the added value, for example, of the CRH test, the, uh, the incremental diagnostic value in, with such high ba base ground uh, uh, probability of Cushing disease. So I think that, uh, as John mentioned, this instance, uh, some tests like the CRH test can be, uh, can be postponed. Uh, concerning MRI, of course, it's a very important diagnostic tool because it may show a, a convincing image in, uh, let's say, 60 to 70 percent of patients with uh, Cushing's disease. But if we adopt the strategy of treating hypercotalism rather than its cause, at least while waiting for the epidemic to faint, I mean, uh, MRI is not that so important. As John mentioned, uh, the, the, the macroadenomas that may be responsible for uh, optic chiasm injury are a very rare condition in patients with Cushing's disease. So you may limit according also to the pressure in the hospital. If there is a high pressure, high pressure uh, with a radiology department, you may limit MRI to patients who have uh, uh, headaches, who have uh, at uh, clinical examination uh, symptoms like visual field defect that suggest uh, a macroedema with a huge uh, supracellar extension. So I think that all these examination in a different strategy are not fully mandatory, mandatory and can be uh, postponed. It's also the same as I mentioned for IPSS. You can, in ambiguous cases, you can still treat your patient with drugs and perform BAPSS later on. Uh, and I would just end my answer with a special issue of a BAPSS because you know that uh, to have a, a valid uh, response, your patient must be hyper in a state of hypercotalism in order that uh, the excess of cortisol just uh, uh, inhibits the function of the normal corticotrophs. So if, if your patient have been treated for a long time with uh, cortisol lowering drugs, you must stop them and ensure that your patient becomes hypercotalic before uh, performing BIPSS. Thank you. And um, a question to you, Jerome. How did um, France or Paris or your center deal with transvenoidal surgery during COVID-19? Well, there, there was a ban uh, in our center and I think in most centers in France for any transvenoidal surgery for about two months. Um, so, of course, for all the Cushing disease patients, we just follow what was written in the article by my great colleagues to treat them with anticortisolic drug during this period. Uh, now we are starting again to have access to transfernal surgery, but uh, of course the number of procedures that are currently performed is lower than uh, in the regular basis because uh, the safety measures are increased. And um, what I've been decided with our neurosurgeon is to stratify the patient and to start, of course, with the one with any large tumor, especially, of course, if you have clinical symptoms due to the tumor mass, but also to start again surgery for Cushing disease and for the other type of adenoma to be later on. But I think we will, even if we don't have a second wave of COVID, uh, we will still have three to four months before catching up the delay. And the question of the delay is also the delay of the diagnosis because all these patients that have not been diagnosed during the two to three months, they will come back later, we think. And the question will be, will be, are we, are we going to see patients more severe than we were used by the past because of this delay in the diagnosis? So we'll see that later on. And uh, that's especially a worry for me for adenal cancer because we don't see any acinetaloma right now because the number of CT scans performed is much lower than it was before the COVID period. So this patient might come later with a more advanced disease. We'll see. We'll see. I hope I will be wrong. <laughs> and um, is every patient tested 
who is admitted to hospital um, um, by a, a swab test currently. Oh, you mean a Cushing patient? Uh, no, every patient you admit to oh, the hospital. Every, every patient that will have a surgical procedure is tested the evening before the procedure. Ah, but only the surgical ones? Only the surgery. For the one, it's, it's just depending on the clinical situation. It's not a systematic procedure. Yeah. But you know, in our, in our hospital now, for more than two weeks, we don't have any new patient with a positive test, even in the emergency room. So I think the, the lockdown have been, and I, I hope it will remain like that, quite uh, uh, efficient for that. Yeah, an experience which we all have made that um, new cases are really down at the moment, fortunately. Okay, um, I have a couple of questions also to the treatment, but we have now 12 questions coming in from uh, the audience. Should we do the, um, the question from the audience? Maybe this is a very good idea. So I have here um, one question regarding Cotrim Azo, um, when by Joanne Kwa, she asked, when do, uh, when do we need to start Bactrim for patients on steroid treatment? So when do we need Cotrim Oxazole to, for treatment for preventing of um, pneumonistis um, infection? Who wants to answer? I'll answer if you like. I, I think that if the patient has got moderate stroke severe disease, you, you start that as soon as you're convinced that's the disease that they've got. Um, because until the cortisol level is, is sufficiently lower, there's still a risk of that. And it, it needs to be sufficiently low for some time because the immunosuppression remains. So I think the consideration needs to be given really when you are sure. The more severe the case, the more you're likelihood of giving it. Um, and I'm afraid you, you, it's hard to be more specific than that. But in answer to the question of when, I think when you've made the diagnosis. Good. It's a question by Tejmal Riemann. The question is, if patient is on ketoconazole, how frequently should cortisol levels be checked? And what should be optimal range to aim for serum cortisol? Um, Antoine, would you like to answer this question? Ketoconazole, how frequently should be urinary free cortisol or serum cortisol be checked? Sure. And what, what should be the range? Where should the... Sure. So it, it depends on the strategy that you adopt. In the strategy uh, that John mentioned that we recommend, which is a block and replace regime, in this instance, I would suggest to perform... Uh, so in this instance, you target to have very low cortisol level, almost to zero in, in a, at maximum. So you can perform a simple uh, 8 a.m. morning plasma cortisol after five to seven days, and you should al already have your, your, your target. And in this, in this instance, your target is to have low levels. If you do a titration regimen, it, it's, a, it's another story because in this instance, you aim to have a normal urinary free cortisol or what is performed in, uh, in UK is to have normal uh, uh, serial plasma cortisol measurement. And, uh, but in my experience, we almost do it in normal condition with titration of UFC. So I would perform a first test after one week, adjust the dosage and then do a UFC every month for three months, I would say. But in the specific context of the epidemic, you can measure your plasma cortisol after five to seven days and increase the dosage if needed to target low, low level of plasma cortisol. Then you add hydrocortisone replacement and you don't, need, you don't need to monitor any more cortisol. Here's a question regarding a new medication, Ozilotrostat which I think will enter market in Europe very soon. In Germany, I think the launch is on the 1st of July. Is there a place for Ozilotrostat to treat Cushing's disease during COVID-19 if it becomes available? 
Maybe John, you want to answer that? So I think when it becomes available, I can't think of a reason why it should not be used. Um, and it works at the same enzyme step as metarapone works. It's clearly uh, an effective drug. Uh, we don't have wide experience of it outside those people who have been involved with clinical trials, but there's no reason to think that it wouldn't be an effective drug. Uh, in fact, I'm sure it will be an effective drug. Okay. Here's a good question also by Edward McKeever. Is low molecular weight heparin advised universally in moderate to severe Cushing's, even outside the pandemic? So thromboembolism prophylaxis. How do you deal, Lynette, how do you deal with um, low dose heparin? Yeah, so the, um... The data are not as complete as we would all like. I think the, what is clear is that patients with very severe Cushing's are at increased risk of thromboembolism, um, either DVTs or pulmonary emboli, um, and potentially stroke. But uh, there is also a very interesting data, mostly from Europe, suggesting that people with adrenal adenoma who typically don't have very severe Cushing's also have a higher high risk. So uh, what we've done at the NIH, at least, is to start people on treatment when, um, at the same time, we might start uh, Bactrim prophylaxis for pneumocystis. And so those would be the most severe cases, typically with a urine cortisol five or eight times, five to eight times normal. And um, we do that routinely in everyone who is not at all mobile. So if someone is very um, mobile and walking around, um, we don't always do it, but certainly anyone who tends to be in a chair, in a bed, not moving very much, um, will start. But I, I would say that this is not something that there is an absolute consensus and my colleagues may do something somewhat um, differently. Okay. Um, and how long do you continue heparin after surgery? Let's say it's a patient with pituitary Cushing's. So we almost never do it with pituitary Cushing's because their numbers are not high enough um, to meet that criterion. Um, we have had very few pituitary patients have any event. Um, our events have occurred almost exclusively in their topic patients, and that has informed, I guess, our, our practice to some extent. Um, the, we tend to not continue it after uh, surgery unless someone has had a prior event and then we go back to the recommendations. So if you already have had a pulmonary embolism, there are recommendations for how long to continue. And um, our hematologists are now divided as to whether one should continue this. Um, if um, an event in the setting of Cushing's should be considered for um, near lifelong treatment versus a six month treatment after the surgery. So I think, I think both for the hematologist and the endocrinologist, we're not all exactly on the same page. Here's one question, which is really challenging. Ben Lugri wants to know, with a novel approach suggested during the pandemic, um, the pandemic change, your diagnostic, will the, the novel approach, which we have been suggested, suggested um, as normal, um, John showed during his presentation, this new diagnostic and management approach to Cushing's, will it persist during long term? Or the other way around, what will change due to the pandemic in our overall approach to Cushing's and what will remain? That's a good question. <laughs> Who wants to answer it? Let me, let me Lynette, take, I'll yeah. take a crack at it and I'd, like be, I'd be interested in other people's opinion. Um, I think, um, so, so Antoine and his colleagues have had some interesting experience with the use of CT ahead of uh, other evaluations. And I think if you are in a setting where you have a very, very good radiology department, very, very experienced at recognizing three millimeter ectopic ACTH secreting pulmonary neoplasms, then, and it's a low dose CT, I think that's a very interesting approach that we should all consider in terms of our, should we really be doing um, the testing the way we have done up until now? Should we, you know, 
use this new idea of doing a pan CT scan. That is going to be tremendously um, only viable when you have a very, very good radiologist and an endocrine team who will all look at the films together. Uh, I think that is one thing that we might consider um, changing and that would reduce our uh, the requirement to do other tests. It will probably eventually result in false positives and unnecessary surgery, but I think it's an approach that we should consider. Um, and, and that for me would be the major thing. I, what I worry about the most is these people that I think um, Jerome alluded to, the people in the middle, the ones who are not so um, ill and the ones who are not clearly not ill. So, so the ones in the middle that are not getting attention now, how will we change our evaluation of them? And there, in that setting, you can have an ectopic that looks like Cushing's disease, a Cushing's disease that might be thought of as more like an ectopic. So I think we we still need to be able to preserve testing. It's not quite as simple as we've made it out to be in, in a time when we have access to testing. I, others might feel somewhat differently. John? So I'd agree with all that. I would say though that I think it's important to, to say, I, I, I'm certainly not gonna suggest that medical treatment is the primary way of managing patients in the long term. The primary way of managing patients in the long term, when it can be done is the surgical removal of the causative tumor, even if that's delayed with a period of medical treatment first. So I guess that's in, in part answer to the question. But I think the notion of using an initial CT scan, which is not what we normally do, is going to throw up more um, incidental findings, but I think could be a very efficient way of approaching uh, the condition and, and is actually quite attractive. And it's one certainly which I've been sort of reflecting on uh, since we have discussed this when we were considering the uh, article we wrote. Thank you. Jerome? Uh, I just an, an additional comment. I think that one thing that might change on the long term uh, is that we have discovered, at least in our center, how to monitor patients from far away uh, by teleconsultation. And we were not very used to that before. And I think that for management of the adrenal patient, uh, for instance, the management of the anticortisidic drug, or maybe also the management of adrenal insufficiency, we might be able now to have teleconsultation much often uh, and uh, that might be easier to adapt the treatment than what we used by the past to see them several months apart. And at least for a subset of patients, it might be an interesting way to monitor them uh, more closely than we were used to. So it's not exactly the same question, but it, I think that would be one of the consequences of the COVID uh, period. Thank you. Um, we have now spent 60 minutes, 65 to be honest. And I think we have to come to an end. There are a couple of questions which we will um, answer by via email. And um, some of them are absolutely valid. I'm also stunned by how many questions we got. It's great. But I think we have now to close the session um, I would like to thank, uh, first of all, our speaker, John. This was a brilliant presentation, uh, very clear and to the point, very illustrative the two cases. Um, a big thank to the panel discussants, who all are great experts. It has been so lovely to be on this panel with you. And finally, the European Society for sponsoring the event. And final, final, the audience. We had more than 300 um, people listening to the talk and many interesting questions. So great experience. I think this is also something which will remain after the pandemic has been down or at least is more or less controlled. We will have much more of those webinars. And uh, I think this is a very positive experience. I have been also participating in an, an endocrine society webinar, which was also fantastic. So this is good news. Uh, there's a technology drive to move forward and we should use that. With that, I would like to thank everybody and to point out that we ha will have next week on Thursday, um, a seminar on hyponatremia.
And the speaker will be Miriam Christ Crane, who is uh, also an international expert on that, on hyponatremia and diabetes insipitus treatment. So if you are interested, please join again in one week. And with that, thank you very much for your participation. Bye.